Hi everyone, I'm David Scranton. You know, inflation is, yes, getting higher and higher. Short-term interest rates are low, but about to get higher to try to combat inflation. And as a result, long-term interest rates have been also spiking higher as bond values have fallen. So, are you confused yet? Well, fear not, because now in this video, we're gonna untangle this confusing web right here on the show. Specifically, we'll be covering why there's so much talk and concern over interest rates, what high rates could mean for businesses, for consumers and for investors, and what they could also mean for income investors in particular, members of the income generation. So let's start with why interest rates are such a hot topic. All the hoopla kind of sort of started in December when the Fed announced a plan to start raising short-term rates this year, 2022, to combat inflation. Before that, the Fed had referred to inflation as being transitory and said that it would take care of itself. Well, as you know, that didn't happen, and inflation now stands at an annualized rate of 7.5%, which is a 40-year high. And as inflation has worsened, the Fed's plan for dealing with it has gotten more aggressive. J.P. Morgan Chase economists now see the Fed raising rates at each one of its next nine meetings. Plus, the size of the initial rate hike could be a half percent instead of a quarter percent. So it could be double. Why? Well, the purpose of this is to understand that raising rates increases borrowing costs. Theoretically, that lowers demands. And high demand is one of the forces that drive inflation. Unfortunately, today's inflation is also being fueled by supply shortages. And equally as unfortunately, the Fed can really do nothing to fix the supply problem. It doesn't have a tool for that part of the equation. So that begs the question, how much will the Fed's plan really do to curb inflation? And if it's successful and the demand drops, how big of a bite will it take out of economic growth? These are tricky questions. And it represents precisely why there's been so much talk about interest rates in the financial media. They're also mainly why the stock market has been so volatile and why long-term interest rates have been spiking. The yield on the 10-year government bond jumped from 1.6% beginning of January to almost 2% at the beginning of February. And soon after that, it actually did top 2% for the first time in two and a half years. Now, in general, talk of rising interest rates often creates a sell-off in the bond market, which drives up long-term interest rates. And that's normal and it's necessary. Why? Because long-term rates really need to be higher than short-term rates to help avoid this thing we often talk about called a flat yield curve. And a flat yield curve is usually a warning sign of a recession. So flat yield curve, bad thing. And if all this sounds familiar, you're probably remembering the year 2018. The Fed was also at that time in the process of raising rates after keeping them near zero since the start of the Great Recession. And before each rate hike, Jerome Powell would use his position to jawbone to the bond market so that the bond market would have another sell-off and let long-term interest rates rise ahead of short-term rates. And that's how the Fed was able to get its benchmark rate up over 2%. But all the while, many questioned whether the economy was strong enough to handle the rising rates. Finally, in December of that year, 2018, bond investors said enough is enough, and long-term interest rates didn't spike ahead of the increase in short-term rates. So as a result, long-term rates came down, and the Fed had to stop raising short-term interest rates at that point. Then in 2019, they had a reverse course and they had to start lowering short-term interest rates because recession fears had actually intensified. And of course, this is before the beginning of the pandemic. So will a similar scenario occur this time? Or will the Fed be able to stay its course? Or could a new war in Europe completely reshuffle the cards? Well, no one knows for certain, of course. But I will say that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has already prompted the Fed to consider a less aggressive tone. Why? Well, because global markets tumbled when the invasion first started on February 24th. And at that time, the Fed quickly acknowledged this crisis could affect its schedule. 
Officials said they still expect to move forward with the rate hikes, but the chances of it happening as aggressively as they initial, initially had announced have become slimmer. Nevertheless, the market volatility we've seen since the start of the year is likely to continue and maybe even get worse. How bad it actually gets depends upon many factors, including this tricky balance between how much each rate hike actually helps curb inflation compared to how much it hinders economic growth. No matter how you slice it, short-term interest rates, though, are likely to increase this year. And long-term interest rates will continue to spike ahead of those increases, at least for a while. And for consumers and businesses, that'll mean higher borrowing costs. For investors overall, it'll mean portfolio shrinkage. To paraphrase Warren Buffett, he says, quote, the value of every economic asset is 100% sensitive to interest rates. The higher interest rates are, the less that present value is going to be, end quote. Now, bond investors have already felt some of the impacts, uh, but, the, but, but the greatest impacts are in growth stocks, stocks that don't pay a high dividend um, as their valuations also decline due to these increase in interest rates. Um, and, and again, worse for growth stocks than for value stocks or high dividend companies as a general rule. And for the most conservative income investors, here's the bottom line. Whatever happens, you can continue to count on two things if you're in bonds and bond-like instruments. One, any loss in value in individual bonds and bond-like instruments due to an increase in interest rates is a temporary loss, a paper loss. Why? Because you have a contract in a bond or bond-like instrument that guarantees the return of your principal if you hold it to maturity and guarantees your interest payment on a regular basis. And of course, all this assumes that the issuer doesn't go bankrupt. And second, regardless of market conditions, your income doesn't shrink, even temporarily. Sure, stocks can cut dividends, but again, a bond, an issuer of a bond really has to default on his debt in order to cut that interest payment. If you're a more aggressive investor, whose portfolio includes a high dividend yielding value stock strategy, then the market volatility is going to continue this year. And it might just create some great buying opportunities for you to increase your growth potential and to increase your income. And if you're in good, high quality stocks with good companies, then unless things get really bad, you shouldn't have to worry too, too much about dividend cuts. And to help us out with this also important topic is today's guest, Matthew Johnson. He's the president of Johnson Wealth and Income Management, a retirement income store in Iowa. He's also the host of the Capitalized Life YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe to his channel. Matthew, always great to have you here. Hey, thank you for having me, Dave. So do your clients really understand, do you find, not your clients, because you spend a lot of time educating your clients, but let's say prospective clients that sit with you for the first time, do they really understand the impact of, of interest rates going up and, and why it's happening right now? Well, I would say that they do. I would say that being from an agricultural state, um, it's still kind of very much in the forefront of their minds what the 1980s and 1990s was like. Uh, we had interest rates at, you know, 18% and it was, it was absolute hyperinflation. So yeah. When when you think about inflation, you, the, the biggest concern that I see or that I hear every single day is that that possibility that it might get back to hyperinflation, which everyone is scared of. So, you know, I know it's to some degree farmers have a built in inflation hedge because especially if the cost of food goes up, they can pass some of those costs on to the consumer uh, within reason. But how about those in your area that are trying to plan for retirement in a traditional way using financial assets? Um, how do you encourage them to deal with the impacts of inflation? Well, it is absolutely true that there's not nearly as many farmers as there used to be. Sure. And so I would say a vast majority of my clients are not the farmer. They're the person that has worked in the office or they've worked in the factory or they've owned their own small business. And it's a big concern for them because they realize if their dollar is not going as, as far as a dollar used to go, what are they gonna do? 
Well, you know, the old conventional thinking was if you want to combat inflation, you have to put your money into the stock market, right? The stock market's always a good inflation hedge. But right now we're seeing the opposite of that, right? We're seeing that prices are skyrocketing. We're seeing that the stock market's extremely volatile and people are second guessing that conventional thinking. So in my mind, when a person realizes that inflation is starting to grip and they need to be able to combat that, I, I'm going to start with the basics. We're going to discuss, okay, do you have all of your working capital working? It is amazing to me the number of clients and the number of people today that have cash sitting on the sidelines. And I get why they have the cash, right? They're either looking for an opportunity, but more importantly, they're just plain scared. So they have this cash. They've been hoarding it. It's not doing anything. The bank's not paying them for it. So we need more income when we're in an inflationary environment. So what are we doing to get that working capital working? So I make a real emphasis of focusing on interest, focusing on dividends uh, outside of things that are bank-like instruments, things that are more fixed income-like, uh, like bonds and preferreds, things of that nature that are going to provide some working capital uh, output. And that's super important when we're in an inflationary environment. Well, you know, you're right, even more with the stock market being, it's really a myth that the stock market's a great inflation hedge, as Warren Buffett said recently, uh, and it's just simple, but it's true. Uh, you know, for some reason, I say it, you say it, people don't necessarily listen. Warren Buffett says it, actually people listen, which is a good thing. But he said, you know, when interest rates go up, all financial assets become worth less. And he said stocks, bonds, and even, even farmland, I, th I think he mentioned in there, becomes worth less mathematically because it's a, it's a higher... Uh, discount factor. So there really is nowhere to hide. It, it's a question of, you're right, getting your money working for you in every way possible. So Matthew, let's pivot for a moment to the economy because Mohamed Olerian uh, has come out recently and said something that you and I have been talking about for a while, is that he's a little worried about stagflation, that if the Fed works acts too aggressively in raising rates, because they're kind of behind the curve, they're a little too late, that they can snuff off economic growth, uh, but not necessarily solve the entire inflation problem because they can't solve the supply chain side. So now you've got no economic growth and inflation, which is even worse than having inflation with economic growth. So are you still in that camp where, where you see that as being a concern moving forward? And I really do. There is so many different things that are uh, dynamics right now. Um, I think it's absolutely true what you said. The Federal Reserve cannot fix the supply side, right? The only thing that they can do is influence the demand side. And the Feds are responsible for keeping this economic car on the road. They don't want it si sitting on the sidelines. They don't want it stalled. But on the, on the flip side of that coin, they don't want it barreling down the road, becoming dangerously overheated either. Um, did they wait a little bit too long? I believe that they did. Do they have some time to make up? Yes, they do. But throw this whole Russia and Ukraine thing in, and now it really kind of complicates the matter. So uh, I would agree that we want to be super, super careful of raising interest rates too quickly by too much, because if we do that, um, we very much could uh, cause our own recession. We don't want that. Um I think that that his concern is the economy. I don't think his concern is the stock market. I think as investors, we should be concerned about both because obviously economically we have to pay for things and uh, investment wise, we may have money in the market. But if we turn the clock back to 2018, you know, we, we watched four rate increases in the first three. We were like, okay, yeah, maybe we'll accept that. The fourth one, it was all bets were off and the stock market drops by nearly 20%. And here's what we have to remember. Anytime the market goes down, it costs us more than money. It costs us time. Mm -hmm. And that time is worth something. We have to wait for those dollars to come back. So this is the reason why diversification is so vital um, when you're investing for retirement. Okay. So you mentioned Russia and Ukraine. So we'd be remiss if we finish this interview without talking about it. How is this going to affect things? You know, how is this going to affect inflation, in your opinion? How is this going to inflect, affect the, the, uh, the Fed's decision? Uh, give us your thoughts on that. Well, I don't know that the Feds have a choice. I think that the Feds are going to have to 
do this first rate increase, despite what's going on. I think that if anything, inflation could be influenced or pushed even a little bit higher if this whole uh, mess with Ukraine and Russia continues on, because it's just going to create you know, more demand for certain things. Um, and we also know that it's going to affect corporations because there is corporations that are trying to get behind in unity to say, we're going to impose our own personal sanctions on Russia. And in many respects, we're going to see some corporate profits go down. That's not going to look good. Um, the only person that sanctions are really hurting, I think, at this point is the poor potato farmer, you know, the, the average civilian within Russia. So it, it's it's a very delicate dance. We've got a dance. We've got a lot of balls in the air that are ju being juggled right now. And we've got to keep our eye on the prize, which is what is our outcome? And if our outcome is to try to protect ourselves and to try to combat inflation to the best of our ability, this is, I believe, where working with a fiduciary is so very vital. Having a plan, following the plan, keeping your hands to the plow, being diversified and focusing on income. Yeah. So even though uh, you're right, the whole Russia-Ukraine situation could make inflation worse, can actually hurt our economy, certainly can hurt corporate profits in the stock market. At the end of the day, uh, your average investor, there aren't really any major changes that they should be making. Uh, because of this, at least at this point. So uh, have a plan and work your plan. I love it. Good advice as usual. Matthew, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for watching today's video. What's up with interest rates? If you enjoyed it, click the thumbs up button to give us a like and make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel for new content each and every week.